For those of you out there who have watched my part one on this video, I want to thank you very much. And if you've not watched part one yet, please do so before continuing with this part two. And before I begin discussing the elite scholars within this part two, I would like to share with you quickly why and when I began studying this topic of biblical new moons, which includes the sacred calendar of the Bible or compliant with the Torah, right from the beginning in Genesis chapter one. Thanks to an old buddy from Texas who called me around 1986 sometime and said, hey, how about the new moons? Have you studied that? And I said, well, we didn't really discuss it much in our major in theology in college, did we? And so he said, well, take a look more closely, for example, at Colossians chapter 2 in verses 16 and 17, where it says, So let no one judge you in your food or in your drink or in regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Messiah. At that time, I realized, well, I'm observing all these topics that are in this verse based upon the written Torah, but new moons, I didn't know much at the time. And, and so Chris intrigued me and stimulated me to start looking at this topic a little more closely because either I got to take the typical Protestant view that I just do what's right in my own eyes with these topics and don't let anyone judge me. Or I got to realize I got to follow them according to scripture because it's all about the substance of our Messiah. And they all have implications to uh, shadows, as it says, things that, have, are, that are to come. They're futuristic, like, like prophecies that are foretelling things of greater importance of the future. Wow, so I looked at that and I found in also in Isaiah, we say Yeshiyahu, chapter 66, verses 22 and 23. It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make before me, that remains before me, and this is our Creator speaking, of course, not me, so shall your descendants and your name remain. Speaking to the, the people of Israel, of course, in context, a promise there. Now, verse 23, And it shall come to pass from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to a number, all flesh, not just the Jewish people, not just Israel, but all flesh, all humanity, shall come to worship before me. And this is what our Creator says, the Almighty. So I began studying this, and, and by about 2001, I became convicted to start making some changes in my calendar, in, my, in the sacred calendar of when I keep the, the annual holy days, you may use that term, monology, based upon not just the modern Jewish Orthodox calendar, but based upon scripture and what I had found in Jewish history that's compliant with with scripture. And, and of course, I've made a number of changes in my views along the way. Every time though, only when good evidence comes along that is brought to me and ex to expose that I've been wrong about this or that. And, and whenever there's good enough evidence, I'm, I'm willing to make changes. And I, I don't just gullibly, very naively accept evidence. I, I really put things to the test, including uh, what is proposed as academic 
scholarly information, a lot of fake history out there. You've probably heard about the fake news and and well, the adversary likes to create a lot of fake stuff. So it's it's not easy and a lot of people get confused and just give up on the study and the research. But with what I have found in my research and and coming along and studying from other people's writings on this, I have found the best biblical calendar scholar that I know today who is still alive today, is Herb Solinsky. And I, ha I was fortunate enough to meet him back in uh, 2014. He came to the same Sukkot, a feast of tabernacles that I went to. And I had changed my view on when the year begins based upon having enough information that he had given me since then. And I had gone back and forth on the barley versus the equinox topic. What I highly re recommend is his website, free learning website, PDF downloads at www.thebiblicalcalendar.org. And even if you did biblical calendar without the word the in there, it take for me it takes me to the same place, same website with different topics he's wrote, written on the, the calendar, the sacred calendar, the biblical calendar, and with a little information, uh, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this. I can always cut it out, if so. But he he grew up in a Jewish home. I think it's good to know that. A very even though it was very anti-Jesus, he became a believer in Yeshua Hamashiach, aka Jesus, over 50 years ago. And grew up in a Jewish home. He began studying the biblical calendar topic in 1967, gathering as much historical and biblical, credible, provable information from elite Jewish yeshivas and also in the United States universities. He's found here and he's traveled around the country from key universities and yeshiva schools and he's got an amazing testimony with countless hours of research studying and learning to share with anyone who's interested and so after Herb Selinsky watched my part one on this topic he privately gave me some constructive feedback for example he said there's no evidence that elite Brown University, ancient astronomy, archaeology, and translation scholars were Jews, other than surely Otto Neugenbauer, who got out of Germany when Adolf Hitler began turning on the heat against Jewish scholars back around 1940. And, and so there's no evidence that they were religious Jews either, but those who were Jews, like Neugenbauer, perhaps felt a sense of curiosity and or loyalty to help their Jewish people understand why. Why their Jewish calendar still utilizes Babylonian month names. What are the similarities? As well as there's some other Brown University scholars whom I will introduce who do sound like they do have Jewish names, such as Duberstein and Abraham Sachs and maybe some others, but I admit, mostly it's an assumption on my part that some of them are Jewish, um, because I found it interesting to see that Jews in history have often been among elite, among the elite in all fields of our human history, including music, science, math, inventions, inventors, with high tech technology included in our modern times. National physical blessings uh, come when the Jewish people are involved. The founders of this and that, whether it be companies and organizations and countries, which are eventually, of course, the Jewish people have helped change the world's view in one way or another, uh, either for the good or for the bad. Unfortunately, in some cases, we can see, even just in the topic of Hollywood and, and movies, not always the greatest example, but it really goes back to that Abrahamic covenant 
that he will bless all the nations of the earth uh, through the seed of Abraham. As another constructive comment that Herb Solinsky expressed toward me privately regarding my part one video on this topic is that it is not wise to utilize the word always, including when comparing the Babylonian calendar with the Jewish Second Temple calendar history. Now regarding the beginning of each year and each month, specifically as I emphasized in part one, now there are some very unusual different calendar principles that were in practice which are very complicated and good for only those who wish to really study this topic very exhaustively. But to, to be more perfectly accurate regarding the expressed two similarities since 499 BCE between the Torah compliant Hebrew biblical calendar and the Babylonian calendar, point number one is the Babylonian calendar did not allow Nisan 1 to begin before the vernal, also known as spring, equinox from 499 BCE onward. And point number two, this is where I need a little correction from part one, is the Babylonian months, by their names, almost key word is they're almost always agreed with the Jewish months, the Jewish calendar months from 499 BCE onward up and through the destruction of the second temple that is. However, both camps, if I may use that term for lack of better terms, both camps surely did not or did utilize visible crescent moons to determine the beginning of their months for 29 or 30 days and those of you who are out there observing and even within believers today it's hard to find people that are observing it exactly the same and, and it's not for the same reasons I don't mean to propose that but if you're interested you know you can always uh, learn more uh, from you know writing in commenting on this video or sending in an email more privately but the key explicit evidence to proving these two similarities are found within the first 100 years from 499 to 400 BCE. This time period is provided in a chart by Herb Solinsky in his document titled Treatise on the Biblical Calendar. You have to go to number 113 Appendix C pages and that's found on pages 298 to 303 in his it's a 335 page document and those are the pages you'll find it and it's under the title of Nisanu also N Nisan aka Nisan 1 or Nisanu 1 in the biblical calendar compared to the vernal equinox during the century of Ezra and Nehemiah they are the ones who restored the second temple faithfully and digging out the Torah and as I proposed in in part one is that they did not depart from the sacred calendar as as can be translated from the the Torah the written Torah now this is the time period during which the Babylonian month names were accepted by the faithful Torah observant Jews which could not be done so according to say the closest new moon to the equinox theory as you'll find out there in, on the internet today or any specific stage of barley development because the Babylonians is, there's no evidence that they use barley to determine the first new moon of the year and of course their geography is different than Israel which could create different timing as well and the closest new moon happens about 50% of the time over a you know a long extended period of time before the spring equinox so during those hundred years again not one time did the Babylonian month or I should say not one time did the Babylonian year begin before 
the spring equinox. That's Nisan 1, known in those ancient times as Nisanu. As names can change slightly over time. Anyway, therefore, as I expressed with some detail in part 1, the Babylonian calendar is like a missing link. I may use that terminology that has not been known by about 99% of biblical feast keepers today in our modern times. And that's including all sects of Judaism, of course. And But this allows for many counterfeit and inaccurate biblical calendar conclusions and principles to develop, as I'll expose more in detail later in this video teaching. So please stay tuned. I appreciate your patience and interest to continue with this video teaching. But as Herb Selinsky has researched and preserved valuable, priceless, historical, archaeological facts and evidence, as you can see if you're interested, from about 1940 is when Otto Neugenbauer departed Germany due to Adolf Hitler putting heat onto the Jewish scholars in Germany. He knew the astronomer Olaf Pedersen from Denmark and immediately joined him there when he had to leave Germany, of course. At that time, Neugenbauer was already recognized as the world's leading authority on the history of ancient astronomy. It did not take long for Brown University faculty, of course, to offer him a full professorship. So he moved to Providence, Rhode Island, which is the city of Brown University. And Neugenbauer retired from Brown University sometime around 1986. And more about what he did at Brown University later in this video. But uh, the point here is that for about 40 years, I say about 40 years, of exhaustive research was put into ancient archaeology, language translations, and brilliant mathematical calculations. So if you're interested to prove more thoroughly for yourself the following archaeology evidence and historical facts, I recommend sincere believers to go to Herb Selinsky's free learning biblical website, www.thebiblicalcalendar.org, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, the article, the document, the 335 page document, Treatise on the Biblical Calendar by Herb Selinsky. And to be more specific for this video topic, to obtain some personal research for yourself, if you're interested, within this treatise on the biblical calendar, like I said, number 113, Appendix C, found on pages 298 to 303, again with that title, Nisanu 1, in the Babylonian calendar compared to the vernal equinox during the century of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so also important within Herb Selinsky's bibliography, I recommend uh, more information to be found with Noel Swerdlow. And the title of what he wrote is, this is uh, the story of these scholars that I'm going to explain in a, a few, in a little while here, is titled Otto E. Neugenbauer, of course, he lived from May 26, 1899 to February 19th, 1990. And uh, on the pages in there, on pages 289 to 299, under the, the title of Journal for the History of Astronomy, Volume 24, written in 1993. And so... You can obtain more information from there, as I'm also pursuing from Herb Selinsky to get a copy of that. 
and also to learn uh, about Richard A. Parker and Waldo H. Duberstein, who also wrote within his bibliography evidence and published by Brown University Press in 1956, you can find dates utilized in a chart of the new moons of, from Nisan 1, going from 499 BCE to 400 BCE, as utilized by Herb Solinsky. Now, Herb Solinsky also references the computer program that calculated the time of the vernal spring equinox in his treatise on the calendar within the same document, of course, for, for those years in the chart. Again, see pages 298 to 303. And then moving on, there, there are also two ancient astronomy elite scholar references that have made a summary statement of Nisan 1 to begin with the vernal equinox plus, of course, the first visible new moon to equal the, the New Year's Day, also known as Nisan 1. Now, one of them was written by Willie Hartner in Journal for the History of Astronomy, again, Volume 9. You can see there, 1978 page 211 along with uh, volume 10 1979 pages 1 through 22 and the other reference to this was by Bartel van der Waterden Waterden and forgive me if I'm pronouncing those incorrectly but you can see it there for yourself as I inserted the text. And for more resource information and or evidence of what I've just mentioned, anyone can also email Herb from his website for such facts and evidence. Or you can contact me at torahtruthseekers at gmail.com. And to summarize, to summarize Herb Solinsky's well-documented bibliography and evidence and research, much of his research and conclusions are important to learn because, as I'd like to start with, uh, from early 1940s up to 1980s, the early 1980s, Brown University was the world's leading place to study ancient astronomy. Scholars in the field of the history of astronomy, not astrology, of course, but astronomy, also would include astrology because that has a lot to do with a lot of these ancient cultures, but from all around the world, they, you know, scholars came and visited Otto Neugenbauer and his colleagues at Brown University. Neugenbauer got out of Germany, as I mentioned earlier, when Adolf Hitler began turning on the heat against Jewish scholars. And even at that time, Neugebauer was already recognized as the world's authority on the history of ancient astronomy. And as I, I pointed this out earlier, uh, Brown University offered him this full professorship, which led him to Providence there in Rhode Island. So what is so important to know about this? That's a, that's a fair question. And so I appreciate your patience and uh, continuing to listen and, and carefully examine what I have to say here. You can always press pause and come back and listen to more at a different time and try to listen to this at your convenience and according to your interest. But uh, getting back to this, uh, the reason this is important to know, let me continue here. It says, during that time, Abraham Sachs, was a leading scholar in the Akkadian language for translating the Babylonian tablets, as even found in the English, uh, the, the British Museum today. And he was working at the University of Chicago. And Neugebauer convinced Sachs that he should 
leave the University of Chicago and join him at, at Brown University to help more accurately piece together Babylonian astronomy. Anugabauer had already learned Egyptian hieroglyphics and some Akkadian. Anugabauer's PhD dissertation was in ancient Egyptian mathematics from the original sources. So what is so important about the Akkadian language and Egyptian mathematics? Well, first of all, the Babylonian language was Akkadian. And so to understand these clay tablets and when they, when they marked certain dates during that hundred years that I spoke about, especially the uh, eclipses, they wanted to predict eclipses and had the secret knowledge to do that so that they could... Uh, it became a monetary motivation to be able to prophesy eclipses and uh, the wealthy royalty you know appreciated the people anyone who could do magic and and be magicians and so using astronomy and astrology as well they were able to do a lot of um, monetary motivational things but not to get off on that tangent but secondly, they wanted to learn and compare, these scholars at Brown University, they want to learn and compare other ancient empires, such as the Egyptian Empire and how they did their astronomy, see what, what they could learn and how they compared to that, including ancient Israel, for that matter. I'm sure their interest was in learning all the ancient astronomy knowledge and expertise and see what they could find for all these years, like I said, for about 40 years. So after Sachs joined Neugebauer at Brown University, Neugebauer went to work to convince Richard A. Parker to also leave the University of Chicago and join his elite team. Parker was the leading authority on translating Egyptian hieroglyphics. Neugebauer wanted Parker to write a full study on ancient Egyptian astronomical texts. And this was published in three volumes. Parker also wrote a volume on ancient Egyptian calendars. So like I said, they wanted to know not just the Babylonian calendar, of course. So it was Sachs and Neugebauer who published several volumes with translation of many Babylonian astronomical texts. Neugebauer understood all the mathematics behind the Babylonian computations. Neugebauer also used this mathematics in his 1975 three-volume HAMA. That's the acronym for History of Ancient Mathematical Astronomy. And any of you out there claim to be more experts than them on the Babylonian calendar, the clay tablets, uh, their dating. Uh, of course, we're not talking about theology and understanding scripture and interpretations of scripture, but we're trying to find out again why the Babylonian calendar month names are used in the Holy Scriptures. As I pointed out in part one, there's seven Babylonian month names within the books of Esther, Nehemiah, and Ezra, who had absolute religious freedom and, and restoration of the temple, rebuilding the temple, also known as the second temple, because of the destruction of the first. And so, with all this religious freedom, and, and even Zechariah and his book, as I pointed out in, in part one on this topic, video teaching, Getting back to this, the data of the Babylonian new moons that appears in the reference work by Parker and Duberstein is primarily based upon the Akkadian translation into English done by Sachs. And here's why Sachs becomes important for that as well. Along with mathematics supplied by Neugebauer. So they had their expertise and their specialties and, uh, and worked together as a team. But then they put into book form using 
collaboration from Parker and Duberstein all working together as a team here at Brown University for all these years, for, for many years. So we can see here that looking at the story, if you want to study the story in more detail, you'll see that Neugebauer, Sachs, Parker, Duberstein, and the other scholars at Brown University collaborated to achieve greater understanding in Babylonian astronomy, as well as with the Egyptians, of course. So what do we want to go to from here? Well, all this best historical evidence proves the explicit two similarities since 499 BCE between the Torah compliant biblical and Babylonian calendars. Like I pointed out earlier, point number one, the Babylonian calendar did not allow Nisan 1 to begin before the vernal spring equinox from 499 BCE onward. And point number two, the Babylonian months, by their names, almost always agreed with the Jewish months from 499 BC onward. And this is the only logical reason why you would see the, the Babylonian month names inspired by the Most High, by our Creator, into the Tanakh, into the Holy Scriptures. All this explains what causes the Babylonian calendar since 499 BC to become like a missing link, as I propose, to weed out the man-made calendars, posing as biblical true calendars, for determining the biblical holy Moedim, according to Leviticus chapter 23. Most of you are listening to this know exactly what I'm talking about. And what man-made calendars am I talking about? Well, first of all is the Enoch and or known as the Jubilee calendar as found in the book of Enoch, found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and elsewhere. Another uh, man-made calendar is to determine primarily based upon the barley, a certain stage in barley, uh, to begin years as the primary focus uh, with the first new moon when the barley hits a certain stage. It was only one of the factors during the time of the second temple, uh, not, not the primary, uh, when they would potentially postpone a month if they didn't have enough for the sacrificial system. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there's a third calendar system, a theory that the closest new moon to the equinox should should be the 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 beginning of years. And then uh, there are star constellations like the sign of Aries, as some will say, must always, again, we got to be careful with that word always, be seen during the Passover season or first month. And there's no evidence of that within the scriptures or uh, within Jewish history. A little, there's some misunderstanding of Josephus. If you're interested to hear the other side of the story on that, of the misunderstanding, well then again, you can write to Herb Selinsky or myself to obtain that. But anyway, the fifth uh, calendar system here, man-made, that I have listed here is the modern Orthodox Jewish calendar. It, it, it's almost ironic that they would use Babylonian month names because the Babylonians went by the visible crescent. The, the modern Jewish calendar, the calculated calendar, does not. So the timing's not the same. As well as the beginning of years. They have a 19-year time cycle that, that evolved. And, and so sometimes, like this year, 2018, is a classic example of uh, the new moon being two days before the spring equinox. And therefore, uh, most of all these calendar systems started a month early. And then there's also the man-made calendar of the lunar Sabbath calendar. And although they are correct about going by the visible sighting of the moon, most of them out there go by the visible sighting of the moon, which is accurate. I'm not sure about when they begin their years. I haven't studied that aspect of their calendar, but their weekly Sabbaths, that's where they... They have really bad scholarship. They intermix fake history into history of 
of Jewish history about the visible crescents. And they don't seem to realize that the Babylonians went by visible crescents to begin months, which creates a, a contradiction in their, their belief of the calendar system and how they, they falsely claim that the Jewish people changed the weekly Sabbath um, even though they admit to cha changing the the annual uh, when the month I should say begins, there's a, there's a lot of evidence of when the month begins that in, in Jewish history that that has changed. So, in conclusion, let us remember Hosea four six. My people are destroyed. His holy people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because, because you have rejected knowledge. So it's important not to reject it. I also will reject you. This is the Most High speaking, not me. Okay, This is the Most High speaking, quoting him in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6. Because you have forgotten the law, the Torah of your Yah, I also will forget your children. Wow. Well, Malachi 3.6 says he doesn't change. So I think we should take that as a, a warning for us even today who want to be priests or to be leaders, to, to follow him, to be in his kingdom, be first fruits. And also remember Acts chapter 17, verse 30. It says, truly, these times of ignorance, when you're ignorant, of course, Yah overlooks. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And of course, that's when the information is brought to your table, especially when it's brought before you. And if you reject it, it's a lot more serious. It's a lot more disappointing to the Most High when we reject information that he is trying to reveal to us, that he's bringing to us through his human instruments in one way or another. And so... As we have time, as we have life and breath, let us continue. Or if you haven't already, please remember Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, where it says, Seek first the kingdom of Yah and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Music